Welcome to NEC Football Digest. I'm Ralph Fentry, and I'm here to prepare you for week number two on the gridiron. But first, what a week one it was. What a way to open as NEC schools won four of the six games on the week one docket. The only two losses, well, they came at the hands of top 25 FCS programs. So certainly nothing to be ashamed about there. Well, what can we expect for an encore in week two? We'll talk about it next on NEC Football Digest. Just as we did on last week's program, we'll bring you three key storylines for every NEC football game on the docket. And we're going to start on Staten Island, where Wagner will host Merrimack under some Friday night lights. It's the first game on the week two docket, and it's also the first ever night game in the history of Wagner's Amline Field. There's definitely some buzz building about night football on Staten Island, so it should be an exciting atmosphere for the Seahawks come Friday night. The second storyline for the Wagner Merrimack matchup is the Dominator. Dominique Williams has been a workhorse of a running back for Wagner over the past few years, and that was again the case in week one against Georgetown. The Seahawks had to claw back from a 21-7 deficit, and every time they needed a big first down, they fed the ball to Dom, and Dom delivered. The senior completed the comeback with a touchdown run with just 2.48 remaining on the clock. Sure, Dom Williams' 162 rushing yards certainly helped Wagner last week, but the true key to the comeback effort was on defense. After giving up chunks of yardage throughout the first half, the Wagner defense clamped down and looked like the championship defense of 2012. The Seahawks, who have a handful of new starters on the defensive side of the ball, held the Hoyas to only 26 yards in the second half and kept them off the scoreboard. Next, we go to Ohio where NEC member Duquesne will take on the Dayton Flyers. Storyline number one for Duquesne and Dayton. The long running regional rivalry continues. Duquesne has faced Dayton every single year since the Dukes joined the NEC back in 2008. The Dukes are four and one in those contests against the Pioneer League member, and they have won the last three. So let's see if the Dukes can make it four in a row over the Flyers in Dayton. Storyline number two. How about this Dylan Buchel? The redshirt freshman quarterback enjoyed a 300 yard passing day in his first ever collegiate start against a CAA member. Of course, he did get help from those phenomenal receivers as Gianni Carter and Dave Thomas each eclipsed the 100-yard receiving mark. And point number three. What will the Dukes defensive playmakers do for an encore? It's not just preseason All-American Dorian Bell making plays out there. Last week, linebacker Sam Martello and Aaron Reed teamed up for a safety on the first play from scrimmage. Martello added a forced fumble later on in the game, and then there was free safety Rich Bukarski, who had a pair of interceptions and a pass breakup. The Duquesne defense looks like it's loaded with playmakers, and we'll see what they can do for an encore when they face UD. Next up, it's the CCSU Blue Devils at Patriot League member Lehigh. Three keys for this one. First, it's another week and another ranked opponent for Central Connecticut. Last week, the Blue Devils traveled to number 15 James Madison, where they fell 38-14. This week, they'll be taking on the number 19 ranked Mountain Hawks. It'll be Lehigh's season opener as they were idle in week one. Storyline number two. Central head coach Jeff McInerney has been trying to get his Blue Devils to turn back the clock 
to when they played championship football in the 2009 and 2010 season. This would be a perfect time to turn back the clock as the Blue Devils knocked off Lehigh in the 2009 season opener. So a win by Central in Bethlehem certainly wouldn't be uncharted territory. And the third thing to watch when Central visits Lehigh. Take a look at Central's playmaking receivers against Lehigh's 4-4 defensive scheme. The Blue Devils have a pair of tall and talented pass catchers in Tyrell Holmes and Denzel Jones. Both caught a touchdown pass at JMU last week. We'll see how they can do against the Mountain Hawks secondary this Saturday. The fourth game on the docket takes us up to Smithfield, Rhode Island, home of the Bryant Bulldogs. This week, Marty Fine and company welcome Assumption College to town. Three keys for this one. First, the Bulldogs must guard against the letdown. After a dramatic win over a Patriot League team last week, Bryant welcomes a Division II foe to town in the form of Assumption. Bryant must make sure it's up for this one and must not overlook the Greyhounds. After all, it was only a couple of years ago where Assumption went into Patriot League member Fordham and beat the Rams on homecoming day. Certainly, the Bulldogs wouldn't want that to happen this Saturday in Smithfield. Storyline number two. Bryant, nor can any team, afford to give away freebies. The Bulldogs fell in an early 7-0 hole to Holy Cross last week when they allowed a punt return for a touchdown only three minutes into the contest. Certainly, Bryant would like to tighten up on special teams and not allow Assumption to pull off a big play and gain confidence early. The number three thing to watch out for when Bryant meets Assumption is the Bulldogs' rushing attack. Last week's game was Bryant's first in over four years without former All-American running back Jordan Brown. The results weren't so bad, though. In fact, they were quite good. Ricardo McRae stepped up and had a 100-plus yard day on the ground, and newcomer Paul Canaveri averaged 4.7 yards per carry. So watch out to see if the Brown-less Bulldogs rushing attack can continue the success in Smithfield. Our fifth game of the weekend takes us back to Pennsylvania at a Patriot League members venue. This one will be Sacred Heart at Lafayette. Three keys for this one. It'll be interesting to see how Lafayette looks as they have not had a dress rehearsal. The Pioneers downed Maris 37 to 21 in week one, but the Leopards did not play. This will be their first game of the season and it'll come against a very unfamiliar foe in Sacred Heart. These two teams have met just once before on the gridiron with Lafayette taking the decision in 2006. Point number two, the progression of R.J. Knoll. The redshirt freshman won Sacred Heart's starting signal caller job in camp, and then he won his first ever collegiate game and looked good doing it. The quarterback proved to be a dual threat against Maris last week, totaling over 300 yards of offense passing for over 200, and also leading the Pioneers' rushing attack with 103 yards on the ground. Storyline number three for Sacred Heart and Lafayette. With the Pioneers going on the road for the second straight week, they'll again need their defense to step up and be effective. Led by its strong secondary, the Pioneers allowed only 236 yards of total offense last week. Strong safety Gordon Hill made a number of plays, both in the passing game and stopping the run. He had three pass breakups and a tackle for a loss. 
there are only two more games we need to get to here on this week's edition of NEC Football Digest. So next, we're going down south to Georgia, where St. Francis U will open up its season at six-time FCS national champion, Georgia Southern. Three storylines for this one. First, St. Francis takes a step up in class for its season opener. This isn't an FCS versus FBS game, but it very well might as well be. That's because former Southern Conference member Georgia Southern is in the midst of a transition into the football ball subdivision. The Eagles will be quite a tough task for the Red Flash as they've already exceeded the FCS scholarship limit. So there's no doubt that Chris Valerio's Red Flash have a tall task ahead down at GSU. Moving on to point number two. It'll certainly be a hostile environment for the Red Flash, but their defense may very well be up to it. It's a veteran unit returning 10 starters from last year's defense, including preseason all NEC picks, linebacker Bishop Neal and safety Jake DeMetal. The battle-tested group will try to contain a Georgia Southern offense that put up 77 points in its week one win over Savannah State. Moving on to storyline number three, the Red Flash's rushing attack. Last year's success for St. Francis was strongly correlated with the Red Flash's ability to run the football. The NEC's top rushing attack last season should only receive a boost this fall when Kyle Harbridge returns to the lineup after missing all of 2012 due to injury. Harbridge has that big playability that could come in handy on the road against an opponent like Georgia Southern. He certainly won't be phased by the atmosphere on Saturday as Harbridge returned a kickoff for a touchdown in his first ever collegiate game at UNH. In the next season's opener, he gave the Flash a 7-0 lead over Liberty with a long touchdown burst. We'll see if he has any big plays in store for Georgia Southern. And finally, we go to Moon Township, where Robert Morris will host MEAC member Morgan State. Three storylines for this one. Number one, the Colonial Crazies are ready. Robert Morris's student fan group and the entire campus is buzzing that football will be back at Joe Walton Stadium this Saturday. It's officially being dubbed as Band Day. There'll also be schedule magnet handouts. Essentially, it'll be a home opener with all of the trimmings. It should be a great atmosphere for the Colonials who are looking to bounce back after a week one road loss. Storyline number two, will Robert Morris be able to establish its running game? The Colonials managed only 55 yards on the ground last week at nationally ranked Eastern Kentucky, and they'll certainly look to improve that production at home against Morgan State. And the final storyline will focus on Robert Morris's special teams play. The Colonials fell in an early hole when they gave Eastern Kentucky short fields last week. They also failed to convert on a field goal and point after touchdown. In what promises to be a tight matchup against Morgan State, every yard and every point certainly will be important. So there you have it folks, the NEC has seven football teams and they will all be in action in non-conference contest in week two. You can watch two of the matchups right here on NEC Front Row. Mary Mack and Wagner will air Friday night beginning at 6 p.m. and then Saturday afternoon we'll have Bryant and Assumption for you. So that's two games right here on Front Row. And of course, we'll be back next week on NEC Football Digest to bring you the latest about the NEC on the gridiron.